Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining our broker roundtable meeting. We have uh, California brokers Ken Moon and Jeff Green on the meeting today. We also have Shelly Hoiseth, Senior Loan Officer with Movement Mortgage, our preferred lender, on the meeting as well. Uh, Ken, if you would like to start. Okay. Thanks very much, Victoria, and good morning, everybody. Greetings from snowy New Jersey. I'm, I'm uh, in New Jersey, and through the wonders of technology, we can all meet together by webinar. We have people in uh, California and, and uh, Florida and New Jersey and all over the place, so isn't this great? Um, our agenda today is we're going to have uh, some minutes of mortgage um, mastery from uh, Shelley Hoyset. Then we're going to uh, just a quick review of how to eliminate your fees and get information that uh, Jeff Green is going to tell us about. And then we're going to talk a little bit about documents and the BRE. And uh, whoops, I still have small steps in there. We're not going to talk about small steps today. And then we'll have a little Q&A. But uh, first, to start off the program, uh, we have some mortgage information from our strategic partner at Manu Movement Mortgage, uh, Mortgage Advisor from San Diego, uh, Shelly Hoiseth. Take it away, Shelly. Good morning, everybody. Um, nice to be with you from sunny San Diego. Sorry, Ken, that you're in the snow, um, <laughs> although that sounds kind of like fun, I guess. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to briefly chat again. I mentioned this a little bit last week about the um, expansion of our condo review department. Um, those of us in California, we deal a lot with condominiums, so this is a really big added value for us. The, what we are offering now is that with <clears throat> nothing more than the HOA contact information and the name of the condo complex that you're interested in, we will order the condo docs, order the condo cert, take on all the expenses of this, <clears throat> excuse me, ourself in order to get the condo approved Fannie Mae, FHA, and VA for you. So this is on a pre-approval basis, meaning you don't necessarily have to have a specific client in mind or be in contract, but if you have a listing in a complex that is not already approved, then we can start that process for you. Um, a good example of how this would work is that currently right now I'm working with an Allison James agent who has a client with a very specific area he needs to live in, but he's just a little shy of the purchase price. He's a VA buyer, so he can, he can sneak in with the debt ratios and everything exactly where he wants to be, but he's having a hard time finding a VA um, approved complex. So what we are doing is kind of spearheading the complexes that he is interested in, in his area. We're going to pick two of them, and we're going to work on getting those FHA and VA approved. So the VA process takes about three to five weeks. The FHA process is about six to eight weeks. But what's great about this is that while we're in this process, you know, the, the uh, agent can go out, door knock, let people know that we're working on this, and do one of two things, find other potential you know, FHA or um, VA buyers maybe that are renting there and or once it's approved, they'll be the first ones in the know to go out and let everybody know I've got a ready buyer right now um, and get their buyer into the complex that they need. That's just one way of using this service. There's a lot more to it and we are going to talk about that in the upcoming workshop that we're having in Carlsbad, California um, on the 8th, I believe it is, and you'll see more about that. But um, anyway, that's all for me today. I don't know if I'm supposed to pass off to Ken or Jeff, so I'll just let whoever's supposed to go next take over. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, Shelley. That would be me. Uh, this is Ken. And uh, we just quickly uh, review what we said last month, which is that um, please, everybody, keep in mind, and by the way, I've got just a couple of great referrals. Um, one uh, signed up a, a new agent today, a referral from Joanne Petrilli, and another one I have a uh, I have a telephone conference call with a big team that's uh, part of uh, of Berkshire Hathaway um, that uh, 
they're they're currently paying 18 percent to Berkshire Hathaway and they could save a ton of money and they're really a hot team in an area that we've been trying to expand in so uh, that's a that's a lead from uh, from uh, Elizabeth Field and uh, it's really exciting so I'm, I hope we have some good news to talk about it with that one but just keep in mind just briefly you earn residuals by referring agents to AG, AJI and you can refer an agent in any state and you get paid as long as they're with AG, AJI and so are you. Um, it's not hard, you just call or email Jeff Jabora. Uh, you get 10% of all the plan fees including transaction fees. Uh, it does exclude e and but all transaction fees and plan fees and if you get up to four or more uh, in total then it's 15% across the board for all of them. So it's it can really really take care of your uh, your own fees very easily. Um, so be sure and contact Jeff Jabora uh, and uh, and as soon as he gets back from Mexico he'll take care of it. <laughs> He's on vacation for a couple of days, richly deserved. Um, the next thing c coming up is a product near and dear to everybody's heart and that's uh, information. And uh, Jeff is going to tell us a little bit about our FAQ site. Take it away, Jeff. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. And I just want to give you a quick review. A lot of you are already using this site. Uh, we have um, probably somewhere around 2,000 unique uh, hits on the site a month which is, uh, may not seem like a lot, but if you think about it, those are, those are usually one-time entry onto the site to get one specific piece of information. And on the site, you're going to find information about transactions, uh, best practices, uh, how to fill out forms, and the other thing that's really critical is our broker's weekly update. So that's all found on our FAQ site. Our, our broker update is uh, our effort, Ken and I, and our commitment to communicate to you in about three minutes a week. So what we've done is we've boiled down anything that's critical uh, that we think is could be like a gotcha item or something that you might miss, and it's bullet pointed and put on our website, on the FAQ site, and you'll receive a email that will have a link to it. If you want to save an easy to get to link, for the Brokers Update, we have a domain name, brokersupdate.info, and that will land you on the page where all the updates are. You can scroll back and you can find information that will be really helpful to you. So, good place to get information. And also, just a reminder to uh, be proactive in your learning and things that are published, such as this uh, Broker Roundtable, will be on the site as well. There will be a link to it and be able to keep up with everything that's going on so that uh, you don't get a surprise sometime in a transaction or with uh, worse yet, worst case scenario, a call from the Bureau of Real Estate. So thanks a lot, Ken. That's all I have. Ken? Sorry, I, f I forgot to unmute myself here. Um, yeah, you thanks a lot, nice, Jeff, nice and I uh, appreciate, appreciate that. Does everybody hear me okay? I yes, hope. I can hear you fine. Okay, great. Um, so, um, yeah, please uh, please be sure to, uh, to check out that site. Um, it, it's a really great first location because we can't always respond immediately, and uh, it'll it'll really help help save a lot of time for everybody. And uh, I I still get lots of questions about FAQs. I mean about uh, W9 forms and all kinds of things. And the answers are are on that FAQ site. So really appreciate you guys using that, and it'll I think you'll find it's a, a great resource for you. Um, documents in the BRE another uh, another topic that's uh, near and dear to all of our hearts. Um, we just quickly review some of the stuff we talked about last week, last time, which is uh, please be sure to get your documents into Skyslope within 48 hours from acceptance. The the DRE wants us to um, to review to supervise our agents, 
uh, it's required by law. And um, if we don't look at documents until closing, uh, we're we're really we're really in trouble. Uh, it, it happens rarely, but we're still getting some agents who just upload all their documents at closing when it's time to close, and then are desperate to get it approved so that they can get paid. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is not the way it's supposed to work, and and we just we just can't have that. Um, the it's it just creates a huge liability for you and me, and uh, it it's it's just we we can't do it. If there's a problem with the, with the transaction, if there's if there are any issues, and uh, it, it can really come back to bite us. It can result in a penalty to you of a 25% commission split. So. Um, Please, please, a word to the wise, get, get the stuff in on time. Um, the other topic this morning about documents is um, the RCSD. This is um, the Representative Capacity Signature Disclosure. Um, and uh, we, we we've had quite a few questions about this and uh, people asking when do we need it, when, what do we do with it. Well. When it's used is any time somebody's signing in a representative capacity, any any time. It doesn't matter if it's a if it's a trust that's that's the people that own the trust. They live in the house. They're selling it as. It, it doesn't matter. You have to sign in representative capacity because the legal ownership of the property is what determines it. Um, what exactly is representative capacity? Well, it's where the person that's doing the signing represents some other entity, a legal entity. And that could be manager of an LLC, a managing member of an LLC. It could be under a power of attorney. It could be a corporate officer uh, or an officer of, uh, of a partnership, an LLP. Uh, could could be anything, um, and of course a trustee when the property is held in trust. There's all kinds of of options: trustee, co-trustee, successor trustee, all kinds of different things. They're all listed on the form. Um, so when in doubt, if somebody is is uh, one of these kinds of people, just make sure you get this form done. Um, there's one gotcha spot on this form. Uh, the rest of it is pretty much self-explanatory, but the, this, if you, if you can see on the screen here where it says item B, trust, and then to the right of that, it, it has a little checkbox about assets, and then it has the date and the title of the trust. This little checkbox, a lot of times people check this box thinking that they're, then they're supposed to, because they're not really reading it, um, the the line says if you if you just take out everything that's in parentheses, just eliminate that from your mind. The line says the property is held in trust pursuant to, etc. Usually, when you're selling a property that's in trust, that's all you need to do. However, if a trust is buying property and you're using assets that are in the trust, they're the, the trust is the buyer, then you check this checkbox. The assets used to acquire at least the property you held in trust. Okay? So that's that's the, the little gotcha there. It's pretty straightforward, but um, we've had quite a few people miss this one. So if, if, if it's a buyer and they're using trust assets to purchase property, that's when you need to check that box. Okay, um, it's one tricky box. <laughs> so, the other thing is about signatures. Um, I've got an example here of me and my corporation, um, and and who signs. The entity name is the name of the entity that the person is is representing. This could be the 
Bobby Byer, Bobby Byers Trust, or it could be uh, Sally Sellers uh, uh, LLC, or it could be just about about anything. But whoever it is, let's say in this case it would be the seller is a corporation, and I'm signing as the president of the corporation. Then the buyer, Bobby Buyer, has to acknowledge down at the bottom. Okay. If the if LQ Moon Corporation was buying the property, that I'd be signing as the buyer, then we'd need to have the seller sign to acknowledge down below. That's how the signature block works. So not difficult, um, but and pretty straightforward. But um, uh, people have been caught up by it. So hopefully, none of the people that are on this call will have that problem. Um, the um, the next next document we're going to talk about um, is the contingency of purchase form, the good old COP form, and this particular form um, has one big gotcha on it. it it's um, it's funny because the title of the form says it's um, it's for a buyer or seller's contingency of purchase. But when they revised the form in November, they left off the seller part. All it covers is a buyer's contingency to sell their own property. It doesn't cover the seller's contingency to sell their own property anymore. So um, if you have a seller that needs to buy new property before they can sell their property, um, you need to do that with an addendum, or there may be another form coming out from... Uh, from uh, Car Legal, I've, I've actually got a. I'm waiting for a call back from some people at Car Legal to find out what exactly they're doing to get this fixed because it's a little screwy and it's got everybody confused about it. So uh, that that one's a, a clever little little change. Um, the the um, uh, we've got a glitch in the program here. I'm going to uh, switch over to the form and um, it, as you can see here on the form and I'm, I hope everybody can see this clearly enough it's not not super big on my on my screen here um, but the uh, you need to choose um, uh, one of the one of the situations here, either item number two or item number three, for the buyer's contingency. Um, if the buyer's property is not in ex escrow yet, you check number two. Now, if you check number two, please don't check number three. <laughs> that seems pretty obvious, but you'd be surprised. Um, and then if you check number two, you have to check one of the ones below that. You either check it's not yet listed for sale, or it is listed for sale, okay? And if it is, then we need the MLS number, okay? Uh, the next one, the buyer has 17 days to get it into escrow, item C there. And then they need to provide copies of the contract, etc. Okay, all that's pretty straightforward. If it's not in escrow, then we choose item 3 buyer's property, uh, I'm sorry, if we did not check item two, we need to check item three, buyer's property is in escrow. And we need to put the name of the escrow company, the escrow number, and when it's scheduled to close. The next little line there says that they have to deliver evidence from escrow, that it's in escrow. Okay. Now, um, there's one more little tricky part on this form, and it is down here at the bottom. The um, delayed right to remove contingencies here. Um, you, item 7, backup offers and seller's right to have buyer remove contingencies or cancel. The, the seller 
has the right to continue to offer their property for sale or backup offers. If, if the seller gets a backup offer, they can either notify the buyer that they have to remove their loan contingency or cancel, or item B, if agreed to in advance, the, the buyer can get the delayed right to notify. That means that the seller cannot notify them that they've got a good offer and cancel any time during the first 17 or more days, if you fill in a different number there, after acceptance. Or item three, even more complicated, during the term of the entire agreement. So that means until they close, they can't, they can't do it. Okay. Now, you'd think that's pretty open-ended during the term of the agreement, but if you look back up at the top um, here, that if it's uh, if it's not in escrow, they have 17 days to get it into escrow. So. Um, or the number of days that you fill in up here on item 2C. So um, we get a lot of questions about this form. An attorney at uh, Car Legal told me that this is probably the most off, often misused form in the whole panoply of forms that are that are included in ZIP forms, and um, I suspect they'll be making some more changes to this form as time goes by to try to make it simpler. Uh, one of the things they've done is they've eliminated the whole thing about the seller. It's funny, it, uh, it says contingency for sale or purchase of other property, but they don't have the contingency of purchase anymore. Uh, they just have the contingency of sale. The contingency of purchase is no more. So. Anyway, if anybody has any questions about this, please don't hesitate to contact me or Jeff, and um, and hopefully we can we can all do uh, keep it keep it so it's uh, it's correct. Um, the um, excuse me here for uh, more information. Remember our FAQs at allisonjames.info, um, and if it's not there, please fill in your own question, and we'll, we'll try to get an answer for you and put it all together, or call Ken or call Jeff, and uh, we'll, do, we'll do our best to get, get you the right information as quickly as possible. Um, the next item on the agenda is if anybody has any questions. Does anybody have any questions for us, Victoria? I do have one here. Do you need the RCSD when taking the listing or when you have an offer? Well, um, the answer to that question is if somebody is signing the listing on behalf of a, an entity, if the listing is a listing from a trust, then they are signing in a representative capacity. So yes, you need the RCSD when you're taking a listing. That, that brings up another point too I've, I think is kind of interesting. I read a, a legal um, ruling that occurred um, because somebody took a listing and they didn't get the agency disclosure AD1 form signed before they took the listing. And everybody would say, gosh, they just forgot. Well, in this case, a couple weeks later, they realized they hadn't done it. They went back to the seller and got them to sign the AD1 form. But you know what? Because they didn't have that signed before they took the listing, that meant that the commission um, information was invalid. They went ahead and sold the house. And then the seller said, well, I didn't sign this AD1 before I, before I signed the listing agreement, so I don't have to pay the commission. And guess what? The court agreed that they didn't have to pay the commission. So um, these forms um, 
are very important that we do them and we do them in the right way. Uh, the agency disclosure AD1 form always has to be offered to the client before we submit a listing or an offer. Before we do a listing or an offer, you have to do the AD1 for the listing or the AD2 for the offer. Um, very, very important. Otherwise, there's no obligation for anybody to pay commission. And uh, even though we all do this because we just want to make people happy in their homes, it's nice to get paid. So, any other questions, Victoria? I have another one here. Can you explain again the acknowledged in the RCSD? Yeah, acknowledged is um, is just like um, let's let's go back to the, I'll go back to that. Um, acknowledged is just like um, the way the other party signs any other any other product any other uh, uh, form. Um, if, if we have um, somebody signing in a representative capacity, but let's say as an example, um, the previous question, somebody is doing a listing in a trust, okay? The, um, the trustee is signing a listing agreement uh, as uh, the representative of the of the um, trust, as the managing member of the trust, or the trustee, or the co-trustee. The um, so when they sign that down here, it would say um, X Y Z trust. And they would sign right here. We'd put their name in here, and then they'd sign. Uh, then down below, when the buyer uh, puts in an offer and it gets accepted, then the buyer needs to acknowledge that the trust is being represented by Ken Moon here, who's signed. So the buyer would acknowledge and would sign and acknowledge down here. Okay. If the trust were buying the property, if there's a property listed by Joe Seller and, and the trust is buying the property, then um, the seller would acknowledge that Ken Moon is signing for XYZ Trust as the buyer. Okay? So it's, we have to have the buyer's acknowledgement if the seller is a representative capacity, we have to have the seller's acknowledgement if the buyer is, in, is acting in his representative capacity. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, anything else, Victoria? No, I think, uh, I think that's it. Okay. Um, well, um, if that's all everybody has, it's a, it's a short one today. I'm, I, we don't want to take too much time out of your day. Um, we have information sources here for new laws and new forms that come up all the time. Um, this legal update is just one I use as a resource. Uh, this attorney, John Giardinelli, is the attorney for PacWest, which is my home association. and. Um, and he has a free newsletter and reports and things, and this is a, a great location to go for. I don't get anything from John Giardinelli, and it doesn't cost you anything to, to uh, sign up for this, so it's, it's, a, it's a good thing. Um, future events, our next Broker Roundtable, I didn't update that, will be in April. Um, please read your broker updates and emails, and we're, we're trying to make sure that we get information to you once a week and keep the information flowing. So if anybody has any suggestions, by the way, of topics for these roundtables or things that you'd like to see us cover, uh, we'd be delighted to respond to that for you. So please uh, let Jeff know or me, and we'll be happy to do it. Um, and by all means, tell all the other agents you know, and uh, you can eliminate all your fees, which would 
a really good thing. Okay? So everybody have a happy Easter, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye.